gender transition doesn't save a life. Adolescents want instant gratification, and they get it, but there's always something, and many times many things, that have happened to really mess them up. So it's the opinion of a three-year-old and of a 13-year-old angry girl or boy, and they swear they're going to kill themselves because they're told, oh, by the way, we're going to make that all better. And they say that to the parents, too. Oh, they, they coerce them. <laughs> Welcome to Edify. Gender medicine is neither science nor medicine. And I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Quentin Van Meter to the program. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. He and his wife, Kathy, live in the Atlanta area. They have four children and six, seven, eight grandchildren. S We're six and a half. Six and a half grandchildren. All right, I like it. It's like the average number of children a woman has is 1.6. And you're like, how does that work? That's great. All right, so... I'm really glad to have you here. I want to ask you something. So I've been having children for a long time now, 19 years, and the the radical change that I have seen in the hospital system and the pediatric discipline in those years with my own children, it's hard to express how much it has changed. And my last experience just a few months ago, giving birth in the hospital, I walked in and all the doctors had trans flags hanging from their name tags. I had to put down my preferred pronouns on my chart, which I refused to do. And then they also had a chest feeding class offered to me as part of my childbirth education. Can you explain to me how this, how did we get here? Well, this is sort of the, the blossoming of this evil flower that has been had roots, you know, planted back in the late 1800s, actually, in, in, the, in uh, the Frankfurt School, tied into Marxism as a, as a kind of a concept of how the world should run, uh, where essentially the family is to be torn asunder, uh, that, that, that your biologic sex has no meaning, you're interchangeable, there's no purpose for being a man or a woman in particular. You can basically run people however they wish to be run and, and identified. Uh, you can pit people against each other, one class against each other, so that you have an underdog who's, who's struggling, supposedly. You create these kinds of conflicts in society to tear society down. And this is just one of the aspects of, of this, this concept, is that if you get rid of the concept that there are two sexes and that sex is, is consequential, that it has a purpose, uh, then you can basically tear everything apart and you can then run the world with your sort of totalitarian kind of concepts of, of uh, and power struggles and you're on top and everybody else is, is basically torn into small groups that fight with each other. And so we're fighting, we're fighting each other a lot. There are two major groups in this gender uh, situation. Those of us that believe that sex is binary uh, that it is that your, your sex is determined at the moment of conception and that you cannot do anything medically or surgically that will change that, that every cell in your body is sexed, either male or female. Um, so it is now to the point where that's to be erased. I just read an a, a, a expert report from someone who's a self-proclaimed expert in the field of gender medicine uh, from Los Angeles who said that biologic sex is inconsequential and it's a term that is Oh, oh, so yesterday and should be thrown out because it has no meaning, okay? And I, I read that and I'm thinking, uh, I went to med school. I didn't even have to go to med school to realize that there are two sexes. I was going to say, we don't even need science to no. tell us this. I mean, this right. is just, it's, it's what happens. It's how reproduction happens. You've got, you know, one, one gamete and another gamete. They get together. There's not a gamete and a half or, you know, various shades of that gamete. It is a sperm and an egg, and there you go. That's reproduction designed... Uh, uh, phenomenally by God to, to, to basically create humanity and let us flourish on this earth. So um, the, the battle of, of the gender industry, if you will, is to basically take religion, take family, uh, and throw it away, make it essentially inconsequential or unimportant. Mm -hmm. And that's a battle that, you know, I, I will, with every living breath, you know, try to preserve the fact that there is the science of natural science of you know, natural law that there is male and there is female. Yeah, there are so many threads here and it's hard to know where to start. Uh, I would like to dig into a little bit of the history of this sort of like transgender medicine. Cause like you said, the idea that sex is binary and that we are created male and female from the moment of conception, it it is it seems so common sense and yet we have entire hospital systems taken over now by the exact opposite conviction that this is just sort of surface and you can manipulate your body to match your feelings or whatever that means. 
Um, tell me a little bit about how this came to have such a grip in the United States. And I'm thinking in particular of John Money and his research. Um, and I don't think everyone realizes that the roots of the trans movement were actually with this guy and his sort of strange experiments. Well, he and a few colleagues, uh, Harry Benjamin and then Alfred Kinsey, uh, the, the sort of the sexual revolution. Kinsey rings a bell. That's yeah. like a well-known name. Um, and, you know, this started in the 1940s and 50s as an idea. And John Money sort of borrowed and is sort of given the, the, the label of having established what is a gender identity. And he was described it as the internal sexed self, okay? So if you can take male and female out of the equation and you can put a gender identity on top of that, then the gender identity can be anything it wants to be. It does not have to be you're male or you're female. Mm -hmm. And it's a very blurry sort of blend of sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender identity, but the, getting the word sex out of the, of the lexicon has been the thrust of this, so that you really do have a sense that, that your biologic sex is of no consequence. And Money believed that you could play with that. You could say a child, and he came to Hopkins for, for a very specific reason. Johns Hopkins was sort of the epicenter in the United States of expert uh, clinical research in, in hormone physiology, the, se the sex hormones, testosterone and, and estrogen, and how they work to create and then take the, the a fetus that is undifferentiated and create a biologic male uh, persona in terms of appearance, and the same thing for a female. Uh, there were- A human fetus. A human, human, yeah. So human babies in the end, and they basically start out with a sort of neutral set of equipment in terms of genitalia internally and externally. And then it's a very active process for testosterone in the male to basically masculinize the genitalia and to, to get rid of the internal plumbing that would become the uterus and fallopian tubes. So that is a very active process. Remaining female is a very passive process. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say one's better than the other. I don't want to be judgmental we won't at all. Get into okay. That. No. <laughs> but it is a very it's a beautiful process and it's just it's hormone driven. You have to have the hormones, you have to have the receptors. And there are little interruptions along the way that are, are rare, um, some more common than others. But that it's would not, be like it's, the intersex and, thing and that it, they talk about. It's called intersex, right. but okay. yeah, the, the, the correct term, the actually best scientific term is uh, disorders of sexual differentiation. Okay. But that to some is so offensive that you would call it a disorder mm -hmm. that we're now going to soften it and call it a difference of, of, of uh, sexual differentiation. But the point being that there are some mistakes in, in, in with enzymes missing, which are r random, and, uh, and they'll they'll cause issues where they they're overproducing one hormone or unable to produce a hormone, mm -hmm. and it either subtracts out the ability to develop into a male, or it virilizes or makes the female genitalia look more masculine. Okay. And so, as an endocrinologist, that's our that's our ball yard. And so, we're, and so Hopkins was the place where this was all sort of laid out. And, and John Money went there because he thought, ooh, ooh, I have this idea of gender identity. So where does that come from? And he sort of originally said gender identity is established in a child by, the, by their second birthday. Mm -hmm. So if you have somebody with ambiguous genitalia, you want to get them aligned to what they really are by their second birthday. So surgeries were done to basically do as much uh, reconstruction of the genitalia to look like they belong to the biologic sex they were. Uh, in infancy and in toddlerhood. And he wanted to know about the psychological aspects of when you do this, what, is the, what happens to the child's identity? Um, and he played a really dangerous game in taking a biologic male whose penis was accidentally burnt off in a botched circumcision and said, okay, get rid of all your testicles, get rid of the penis, sort of create a sort of a vaginal opening, if you will, um, and surgically, and, and then we're going to raise this child as a girl. It was a, one of twins, so he, there, was a, there were two brothers originally, and now there's a brother and sister growing up. He was a, a really perverted individual, and I don't like name-calling, but, I mean, the man was really strange. And, I mean, I mean, knew him personally. I mean, he taught in the lectures, and he did things to profoundly upset the very religious females that were in the, pre re the fellowship program. He targeted them over and over again to make them very uncomfortable. And he had, it was, he had great joy in that. He just, just knew how he worked, that this is not a nice man, not a man who has any ethical scruples at all. And so he took this pair of, of siblings that, that now became a brother and sister 
and he taught them how to manipulate play with each other's genitalia when they were toddlers and youngsters and kindergartners. He made them sort of pretend they were having intercourse. Uh, did all of these things that came out in the in the story when it finally sort of blossomed into a full book. Um, this, the end of the tale was very sad. The the original brother who remained uh, the boy that he was ended up being a drug addict and died of an overdose in his early 20s. The the boy that was changed into a girl supposedly ended up finding out because he just knew something was not quite right that he was indeed a biological uh, male. And they, he basically had some a little bit of whatever reconstruction he could, but was infertile because his testicles had been taken off, adopted some children, grew up into his early 20s, and hung himself on a swing set in the backyard. And, uh, and that it, it was a tragic ending, and that should have said to everybody about John Money. He's writing these books. Hopkins is publishing them. It's all about the fact that this is all very plastic and pliable and the uh, whatever, and it turned into such a train wreck. And so they just unplugged him. The, the chief of psychiatry came in, a world-renowned psychiatrist in terms of human sexuality, Dr. Paul McHugh. And he looked at the program. Uh, and Money was also working with adults. He had a stable of maybe 15 or 20 adults who he transitioned to the appearance of the opposite sex over the course of a number of years. Um, they, McHugh said, all right, this is an experiment. It's an unconsented experiment. There's no protocol. It's not been monitored. I want the results of what's happened to these people. And he, so he had one of his uh, fellows do a, a, a research of all this and found that this transition to appearance of the opposite sex, and they used to call it transsexual back then, uh, did not improve the mental health of these people at all. And so McHugh said, done. Program's closed. That happened just after I finished my fellowship. So we had seen the works of John Money, and, and he would do interviews with everybody that had anything to do with puberty or ambiguity of genitalia, early puberty, delayed puberty. He had every, everything that had to do with sexual hormone function. He interviewed these kids, and they were, the, they were transcribed into typed uh, papers that were stuck in the medical chart. So we read every word of every interview, and it was astonishing what he asked these kids. Uh, he taught a six-year-old boy how to masturbate. Uh, and it was like, you can't, if that happened in today's world, that person would be in, you know, in jail and license taken away. But back then, it was just, it was just sort of under, underneath the, the surface, and no one really knew about it except those of us who were in the fellowship. We were all very dismayed about it. Um, and we just kind of put up with him because we weren't in charge. So, you know, he was on the faculty of Hopkins, and he intervened you know, with our patients. He, took, he interviewed them and took care of them, or so-called took care of them. So uh, we, we didn't like that at all. And when it went away, we thought, oh, good. It's gone. It's gone. You know, it's been proven gone. It's bad. It doesn't work. It's perverse. I did not know you had met John Money in person. Yeah. He gave a, a lecture on purpose just to upset they were both Catholic, an Iranian Catholic and a Polish Catholic. Oh, wow. She and her mom had defected from Poland yeah. at the time. And the Iranians, like, escaping. And, yeah. um, and so they, they were there in the room, and Money came in with his, it was just a, like a legal pad and a pencil. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, I think I've discovered a new, new issue, a new theory. And he, so he started drawing, and what he drew was an amputated leg stump with semen squirting out the end of it. And he said, I think all amputees basically are, but traumatize themselves so that they can have amputations and they can masturbate their stump. Oh. And he said this. I in mean, front just, of these women. I mean, in yeah. front of these women. Oh, it was, and a crude pencil drawing. I mean, there was, it wasn't a slide. It wasn't a PowerPoint because we didn't have PowerPoints. I back then. Up and I looked at that and I said, Dr. Minnie, I just completed my residency a while ago at the Naval Hospital in Oakland, and the pediatric floor was half of pediatrics, and the other eight part of the eighth floor was the amputee uh, ward where, for the National Prosthetics Research Lab, where they developed prosthetic limbs for people coming back from the Vietnam War who had lost limbs. They have in-depth yeah. psycho psychological evaluations of these people, because they understand about the body image and losing a limb and what it does. I said, I have that was never discussed. It, 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 it didn't exist. You just made that up. So he said, yeah. oh, well, then never mind, and took his paper, pad and pencil and left the room. 
It was just to That's, like, poke at those it was, it was basically, and, and he was trying to develop a new bizarre concept. And I just kind of shot it down at the base, yeah. and, I, and he just w- w- walked out. So I finished my fellowship in 1980, and, and I was on active duty in the Navy for 20 years. They actually, Thank did, you. I did my residency <laughs> in the Naval Hospital in Oakland, and they paid for my fellowship at Johns Hopkins, and then I owed them back service, and I stayed in for 20 years. I was in the t- teaching hospital in Oakland where I originally started as a resident, and I ended up being the chairman of the Department of Pediatrics and ran the residency program. So it was a really wonderful ride, an opportunity that the Navy gave me, and I really cherished the fact that it happened. I went and left the Navy at 20 years and came to the Atlanta area and set up shop as a pediatrician and endocrinologist together, working general pediatrics, which I love. And uh, a patient came to me in 1993, a family that said, uh, you're an endocrinologist, we're on active duty, and, and we've just moved from Columbus uh, to the Atlanta area. Uh, and dad was, I think, working at one of the recruiting offices. He said, um, my 13-year-old son wants to be a girl. And I thought, wow, I haven't heard of this like since the old John Money days. What's going on? I've never never had a kid. The, 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 the patients that Money did as adults were adults, consenting adults. So I called up you know, to my, my old program director at Hopkins, and I said, Ooh, who can I talk to? This is something that I have no experience in, in taking a 13-year-old biological male. And it, 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 this kid came from Los Angeles area where he, a psychiatrist had said, yes, this, this, is, this is what you need to do when you move, the next move, create a new persona for your, your son to be a daughter. No one will know. So uh, social transition. Yeah, social transition was boom. Uh-huh. And so um, I was the only one in my office who knew the story. My front office staff had no idea that this wasn't a girl that came in. Wow. Um, and so everything was secretive. The medical record was kept separate and not, not available to anybody just to go to review. Mm-hmm. Um, the attorneys for the medical practice said, if you're going to do this, we have to, re- we have to have an informed consent. And so I said, I can't tell them the safety of this because it's unknown giving a boy estrogen to levels to get breast development. Um, so they wanted you to prescribe Right, the they came to treatment. me for the hormone therapy. Puberty yeah. blockers, he was in the sort of what we call in the middle of puberty, mm-hmm. clearly male genitalia, and uh, he was going to school, in high school. Yeah. And so I said, I've got to protect myself legally because this is unknown, uncharted waters. And I, I mean, I knew enough of the endocrine community all over the United States, and I sampled everybody's opinion. They said, we have no idea what to do, but <laughs> give this a shot and see what happens. So I was very uncomfortable, uh, but I started the therapy, and then the family moved again, and they moved up to the Washington, D.C. area, and I shot a letter to the pediatric endocrinologist up at Walter Reed and said, this family's moving. I've given them your contact information. This is where we started. It's, you know, this is not, not something that I was familiar with. Um, good luck. And I have, I've actually never heard what happened to that kiddo after that. So that was one case in 1993. Okay. And nobody knew what to do across the United States. Now, it, along comes Norman Spack up in Boston, and he is, I've never met him, so I don't want to say anything yeah. about him. I, 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 he, he's, I've heard he's unusual. I'll just put it that way. Um, he had spent some time over in the Netherlands looking at their treatment protocol for kids. And he came back and started his own transgender clinic in Boston, and you know claims to be the first of his of his kind. Mm-hmm. And then, very quickly, other academic centers, in order to kind of catch up and be as on the forefront of this mm-hmm. new new That's field, yeah, began to, yeah, yeah. to to do this stuff. And and he actually gave a lecture uh, at a combined meeting of the Pediatric Endocrine Society, which is a U.S. based uh, organization, and the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology (ESPE). Every four years, we'd have a conjoined meeting, either in the U.S. or in Europe somewhere. And this time, it was in New York City. And I caught wind of the, of the program that he was going to be giving a, 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 like a little small lecture. And I, the, ro- the room was very tiny, and it was packed with human beings. And I was at standing room only outside the door, listening in. And I, I just listened to this man and thought, oh, my God, y- you have no idea what you're doing. And you're so glib about it. You know, and he was promoting this concept that this is how you do this, and this is how you transition these kids, and this works, and we're going to block puberty and do all these things. And I thought, I, I really want to raise my hand and say, wait a minute, I 
trained with John Money, and this this is absolute heresy what you're doing. I've seen this before, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but there was no opportunity to do that, and he's you know whisked away very quickly after the meeting, and it's a big meeting, and it's in New York City, and I didn't want to you know. T tackle him and so hold it's very on. much on the margins. Yes, of this. this was no one had heard of this before, and all of a sudden that lit the fire for academic en endocrinologists to sort of say, "Oh, we're, we could do that. We could do that." And then there is sort of a perverse wokeness that happens if your if your institution has a transgender clinic, you get points with the U.S. News and World Report uh, best hospital right. system. Yeah. It raises you up much higher if you. And, so that that's kind of how it happened. It just went from like a spark, and, and then it just is it just spread like wildfire. Yeah, it was, talk to me a little bit about you mentioned you said the word industry twice, and it really has become an industry. Can you tell me a little bit about the financial sort of aspect of the transgender uh, puberty blockers and s surgeries on children? Is that when you say industry, I assume you mean it's lucrative. It has become lucrative because it's brought the endocrine divisions, the pediatric endocrine divisions, from being chronically in the red. Because the patients that we take care of, a lot of them, a lot of the work is with type 1 diabetes, which is very labor-intensive, time-intensive. And the re remuneration is very minimal for the amount of work you do. But you do it because you love it and the kids need you, and that's why you do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, transgender is cash on the barrel head because originally there was no insurance coverage for that. So if the patients wanted to do this, they coughed up cash to, to come in for clinic visits and for hormone treatments or puberty blockers. Now, it's interesting because the hormones that are used, the cross-sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, and in some cases progesterone, are not expensive medications. I mean, there, there's generics that have been around since they've been developed. So that's not a big money maker. But the puberty blockers... Just a standard price tag for one year of suppression is about sixty thousand dollars, and so this right. brings in you know they they develop the drug the puberty blockers are, are it's a, it's a marvel of science that they that they figured out how to do that. It was aimed at shutting off uh, the hormones that produce or that make cancers in adults, prostate cancer in males, and estrogen dependent tumors in females. They could shut the faucet off by telling the pituitary to stop stimulating the, the, the ovary or the testicle and selectively doing just that. A pituitary is a wonderful little thing that does a bunch of things, and this just selectively stops that message to the, go, to the gonads. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just it's marvelous it's, in terms of science. They were able to do that, and we use that in children who have precocious puberty. And by that is we're talking about girls who are four, five, six, or seven who start into true puberty with breast development and... And they're going to menstruate. You know, once that starts, two years later, they're going to have start having periods. It's tough for a second grade girl to handle that socially. Plus, it also eats up their height potential. It matures their bones early. So there are two reasons to stop puberty in, in, in the youngsters. One is to preserve final height and then to the deal with the social issues of being physically mature. Right. So those drugs are used for prescribed you know, periods of time. The age limits are very specific. And you don't keep doing that. You don't keep, you know, I always, I chuckle because the dads, when I've treated girls with precocious puberty, the dads say, can you just keep going on this after that? Because I want to save her from, you know, becoming. <laughs> the teenage daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, want, uh, I, want her, I love I want my a little. teenage yeah. daughters, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but at any rate, it's, it, it's so, but it's very specific. And when you unplug those puberty blockers, everything slowly but surely returns. And they're, there's not giant numbers. These are. This is not common. This is maybe one out of ten thousand kids. Okay, so okay. it's a very specific yeah, very, problem. It's, it is what we yeah. call an orphan drug. Okay, mm -hmm. very expensive to develop in adults in cancers. It, that's its big. That's where they use it. Mm -hmm. In pediatrics, it's a it's a tiny slice of the pie. Uh, so, but they they could repurpose that now uh, as a drug to use to stop puberty altogether all the way through the years when puberty normally happens. And it was done blindly. It's very interesting. The reason they started using puberty blockers was at the suggestion of an adult psychologist in the Dutch protocol. And she said, I keep hearing complaints from my adults that they wish they'd never gone through puberty because the, the girls, the trans uh, women, so-called, have you know, big shoulders, giant hands, you know, feet mm -hmm. the size 15, uh, they, calves the size of Kansas, and hair everywhere, and their voices are down here. And they don't like that. And if we could just stop that. I mean, it's like, I have an idea. What yeah. if we did this? And that's how John Money worked. I have an idea. Let's do this and see what happens. No consent. 
no no future no no long term you know, consequences looked at because it's new. Yeah. Let's just do this and see what happens. It's 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 reminiscent of of horrible medical experiences in World War II. I mean, right. if you think about that. Well, it seems like all the medical ethics, like the ethics protocols are in place to avoid this exact kind of experimentation yeah, really on children. Absolutely, the Geneva Convention yeah. uh, you know, uh, of making you know, the, the rules that you ca can't do unethical things to patients. They must be informed, they must consent, and they must understand everything that they're doing. Yeah. And then they must be monitored. And then if you're going to do clinical studies, the FDA steps in and has an incredible you know, amount of regulatory stuff that goes on that keeps you very narrowly in an ethical space, which is good. Yeah. But this was not, this was just wide open, you know, Wild West cowboy. Wild West. Bing, bing, bing. Right. You know, guns a blazing. And we'll see what the body's account looks like at the end yeah. of the, at the end of the story. So this is this is kind of the, the way that that started uh, in in kids in adolescence is that let's just stop puberty, and then you know we'll hold them there, and they call it a pause. Yeah, I was going to say one of the talking points that you get from the left or from, you know, politicians who are pushing this forward as part of their agenda is, well, it's completely reversible and it does no harm. It, it, where is that coming from? And is it it's, even it's, remotely It's make-believe. Okay? Yeah, so the reversibility, if you, what we don't know, because there are no ongoing studies of kids that were dealing with the gender dysphoria who were not blocked and not given cross-sex hormones, mm -hmm. comparing their trajectory in terms of mental health and physical health out to 10, 15, and 20 years mm -hmm. with kids that were blocked. Okay, so that's how you do science. If you're, if you're gonna develop a protocol, control. you have a, you have a control. And they yeah. say, oh, control's unethical because you're gonna make these kids suffer and they're gonna kill themselves. That's a straw man. I mean, that's, that is absolutely a, a non sequitur. No other kind of, well, chemotherapy, they'll do that, you know, with a, a, something brand new, they'll try it on for size, and they, they, don't, they can kind of loosen the regulations a little bit because it saves lives. Well, gender transition doesn't save a life. I mean, as much as they would like to say that, there is no evidence in long-term studies anywhere on this planet that it does anything beneficial in terms of mental health. There are suggestions that it is actually harmful in terms of mental health, mm -hmm. but it clearly shows no benefit whatsoever if you follow long enough. If you do a study for one year, you have an adolescent that says, oh, I'm in the wrong body, I'm in the wrong body, I'm going to kill myself, and you stop their puberty, and you ask them a year later, how do you feel? They say, oh, I've never felt better. Yeah. I don't have my nasty puberty, you know, and I... I mean, what good is that? It's, it's just, it's, you know, the adolescents are, you know, they, they, they want instant gratification and they get it. Yeah. And then they're asked if they're happy and you say, you see, it's good. Mm -hmm. We got one year data. And that, that's done over and over again. Mm -hmm. Study after study that they publish. And it, it's kind of the stuff that shouldn't be published in reputable medical journals because it's not, it's not valid. It doesn't show safety and efficacy. Okay, right. so then they say you can't do those pr prospective studies because these kids will kill themselves. So it's a circular argument. We have to do it because we can't do it because. Right. And so they somehow get around that and start the gender clinics, which are flourishing, at least 65 in university centers and then all of Planned Parenthood and then some online places and some uh, organizations yeah, called Planned Pyramid where you can just you can get your hormones and get your puberty blockers just by you know, saying hello on a Zoom call. Help me understand how, so you talked, you've mentioned um, American Endocrine Society. Is that The Pediatric Endocrine the Society. The Pediatric Endocrine Society and American Academy of Pediatrics comes um, to mind, um, American Medical Association. I mean, these were, were well-respected institutions that people would look to that kind of, um, that kind of endorsement as a sign of, okay, this is a solid treatment. This is what they say in their books. This past spring, something dropped in the news called the WPATH files that kind of blew that, that legitimacy out of the water for a lot of these organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about what the WPATH is and what those files revealed when they hit the news? So the WPATH was, was essentially born by Harry Benjamin, but back in the, the John Money days, it was called the Harry Benjamin Society for transsexual something or other. And so it morphed into the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Very authentic sounding organization, oh, yes. worldwide, professional, oh, you know. And so it really is a group of ideologues. The, the only requirement for membership is that you pay dues. There's no degree required. There's no uh, certification required. Unlike 
the American Academy of Pediatrics, the big group that we're sort of it's, we're at odds with, uh, that you have to be board certified as a pediatrician to become a fellow. The Endocrine Society, which is not the Pediatric Endocrine Society, but the Endocrine Society, the big, broad endocrine group, mostly adults, you have to be a fellow, a trained fellow and certified in endocrinology to be a fellow. And so the WPATH is just, hey, pay your dues. And, and you know, it's, it's that simple. There's no it's like screening. like an online PhD. Yep. Right. <laughs> so um, they, they began publishing what they call standards of care. And now standards of care, interestingly, sh as, the way they're defined, is a set of recommendations that's brought together by everybody who treats this particular disorder from one way to the other and everything in between. Every single aspect of treatment is laid on the table and these people get into a room and they spend however long they need to to come up with a consensus someplace in the middle. Everybody has to give and take and so that it's, you know, sometimes the, 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 the standards of care so-called are kind of watered down but they're there for the purpose of being a bedrock primarily for legal reasons. Mm -hmm. So if somebody does something and it's outside of the standard of care, you can be called the, into a courtroom and say, doctor, are you aware of this standards of care published here? But these are, th that's not what WPATH did. They, are, they were all like-minded people who were into the concept of, you know, we can change your sex, okay? Uh, and then they kind of said, well, we know, we, we know you can't do that. So we're gonna change your gender identity, okay? And, and so uh, there was a clinical psychologist, still is, is still living, uh, Kenneth Zucker from Toronto, who took these kids, and they, they were as young as three, and all the way up through late adolescence, and he had these kids come to him in Toronto in the 1980s up till about 2013, had about 560 kids that he followed. And he firmly believed this was a disorder. He's a psychologist. He's allowed to say this is disordered thought. This is, if you believe in this and that's what you do, you have a disorder. Mm -hmm. So the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Health, the DSM, uh, had that listed as gender identity disorder. And that's a very good description of it because it is a disorder. It's, is that the same as gender dysphoria? We see that a lot Well, too. what they did is they morphed gender identity disorder so they could take the disorder part out ah. and say that confusion about your, your gender identity and not matching incongruence of your gender identity with your biologic sex is no longer a disorder, okay? Uh, gender identity now is innate and determined biologically. Sex is not, doesn't exist anymore. And so if you're suffering emotionally because you, you can't reconcile your gender identity with your biologic sex, then you are experiencing some um, anguish, and that anguish is called dysphoria. So they said this is gender dysphoria, no longer a disorder. Got that off the books. And it's very, very sneaky to use the language the way they did. Uh, they began introducing terms as birth, uh, sex assigned at birth. Yeah. Okay. They, in, they, they got transgender, cisgender, which drives me crazy. Uh, these are all made up terms, okay? But, uh, and then they started with trans female, trans masculine, just a gamish of everything and throwing. And then it's very interesting because most of the publications on that side of the issue where they were trying to transition these kids to be, appear to be the opposite sex, they, they are sort of getting rid of sex entirely, putting gender in where sex would be, and then doing gender identity piggybacking on that, saying that, you know, there is, this is a mute, uh, innate and, and immutable. You can't, yeah. you can't, you shake it. You are, your gender identity is determined and you have nothing to do with, can never be changed. The interesting thing is that in the DSM-5, the most recent uh, version, it specifically says that there is a fluidity to gender identity that c people can come in and out of that through the course of their life. Right. Now, there's nothing that is biologic that is fluid. Nothing's determined. No, 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 I yeah. I mean, right. so yeah. the same organization that stands and you know, endorses the WPATH guidelines and says they're, that they're solid, at the same time, in their texts, their most recent published text on sexuality in the human being, um, says it's fluid. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have it be biologically determined and then have it be fluid. I mean, it is, but that's the thing is both sides talking out of both sides of the mouth, depending on right. what their audience is or what they're trying to prove. Yeah, it's just a total, like, the principle of non-contradiction, right? The basis of all logical thought is just blown out of the water because you could say one thing one day and say one thing the next day, and it doesn't matter. Right. It's about power. It's about control and 
of billions of dollars at this point. So the the, the big expensive part of all of this, uh, you know, in terms of the industry, if you think about, it, is the surgical side because the reconstruction of of, of pseudo organs. To, to either remove organs that are functional and then replace them with things that, I would say it's like a, ru- a, ru- a pair of glasses with a rubber nose, you know. It has no function, okay. They're gonna try to make it function, but an artificial penis is created out of the, f- the soft tissue of your forearm yeah. and then wrapped in skin from your thigh. It has no erectility available. It has no sensitive areas that, that can achieve orgasm. You are removing the, the sexual function of these individuals by doing that. Prior to that, the combination of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones basically fry the ovary and the testicle uh, in, in an irretrievable way. And they know that because they are trying to do fertility preservation if they can before they go through all this. So they'll say freeze so they'll, your eggs yeah, first. You've and got, then, yeah, and uh, then, or freeze your sperm. And then you can, as an adult... Tran, well, an adult biological male pretending to be a female, you can go ahead and father a child of your own, you know, to... to so they know that it's making, it's damaging the and body. And a very damning article, and this is this is amazing how this works. The, this, there's an article that was just published in the past three or four months by the trans advocates, that, and one of the uh, adult uh, writers of great uh, fluidity, and he just, he's everywhere. He said, you know, we, we we're so proud because we did a retrospective review of records to see who wanted fertility preservation among biologic males before they transitioned. And they don't tell you how many cases there were, but they tell you how many wanted fertility preservation. And then they divide those, and they, they're not talking to the patient, they're looking at medical records. So it's, it's, it's oh, interesting. P- picking, p- cherry picking data out. Yeah. And they said, wow, you know, we had 31 kids, and 13 of them had you know, preservable, active, viable sperm. Wow, this is wonderful news. And that was the point of their paper, is that fertility preservation. The real data in there is that the ones that had viable sperm were in the end stages already of puberty. Blocking puberty, obviously, therefore, sterilizes you. The ones that weren't sterile were not blocked and went all the way through what stage four of puberty out of five stages. The kids in stage three, not not uh, they they were they had no viable sperm. So they're saying block puberty from stage two the minute it occurs, mm-hmm. and as long as you want to, and it, it's reversible. It's totally reversible. And then you say, oh oh, the only ones that were fertile were the ones that we didn't block who got to stage four and they're fertile. So. That's the data so sitting in that paper, but that's on. not the title of the paper. The title of the paper is Fertility Preservation Works. And you think, how can you possibly, you're, you're so focused on, in your bubble world that this is all okay and that this is a wonderful thing you're doing for these patients, and you are, there, there's mor- that morbidity all around you. I mean, you're right. causing incredible amounts of, of disease states by doing these things. Right. And so, but then it's, it's all reversible. Well, it is not all reversible. It is not the what we know, we're gaining more and more. And then the harms of the puberty blockers in terms of mental health are, are, are essentially, they came out with the UK study. They looked at every one of their kids Every one of the kids. And in socialized medicine, you have medical records on everybody. Okay? You can't escape. Right. So the Swedish population studies are the ones that have been looked at to prove that not only is there not benefit to mental health, there is detriment to mental health with both medical and surgical transition. Those studies are the anathema of the trans people. Oh, those are invalid. The author said sub- substance They're candidate. invalid because I don't agree with this. Absolutely. Results, right? And so that's hard science. It's the best we've got because mm-hmm. we're never going to do a prospective cro- cro- you know, double-blinded or, or you know, study with a control group because it's unethical to sterilize children. And we know you sterilize them if you do this. There's no institutional review board that would ever write a consent form that says, I know I will be sterilized, I realize that, and I'm okay with it. Yeah. Because that's a, that's a medical harm. Right. Now, you've mentioned the word consent quite a bit. And as a mother of many children of many different ages, what do they mean by consent when they're talking about children consenting to life-altering hormone therapy? So consent in the United States means you have to be 18. Technically, okay. with carve outs for emancipated minors. Emancipated minors started showing up back when I was in medical school, and the adolescent population was being protected from their awful parents. They could say, I've I'm, I'm left home. 
you know, I'm going to get pregnant, therefore I'm an emancipated minor, and I can do anything that an adult do, to make all the decisions, except I can't drive a car until I'm 16. I can't vote until I'm 18. I can't buy alcohol until I'm 21. Tattoo. Can't get a gun. Mm-hmm. You know, all the things that are there specifically age age dependent because of the developing brain and the inability for you to forecast and, you know, your brain is just incapable of you looking have at frontal consequences. Lobes, right? yeah. Frontal lobes need yeah. to be developed. And it's, conservatively, that's by age 25. Some mm-hmm. some in our generation, <laughs> I'm not sure they're there yet. Uh, but at any rate, so you know, kids making those decisions and they and the, uh, the wording in terms of the, what the trans advocates do was to say everything is individualized. And what that allows them to do is to consent, essentially consent minors, mm-hmm. because it's individualized. We have to know the social circumstance of the kid. We have to know the family. We have to know the background. And then we can tailor the therapy. The therapy is, is not tailored. It's just basically one way, and that's the way you go. You get on the conveyor belt, and you go to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and, th- and they know that, OK? so. Uh, this is the kids can't wrap their head around the fact that you talk to a 13 year old girl who wants to be a boy at the moment, mm-hmm. tra- terribly traumatized kid, you know, struggling to fit in, doesn't is unpopular, unloved by peers, wants to go somewhere, finds this happy family and online that says, "Oh, you know, you could be trans. Come talk to us." And yes, you are trans. You did just what I did, and I'm. You belong. I've never yeah. been. This is your family. We love you. Your parents may not love you anymore, but we do. Come here, come here over and over and over again. We will let you know how much you are loved and respected for your authentic self. Mm. Say that to a 13-year-old girl or boy who is, who is just not happy with themselves. And what 13-year-old girl or boy is happy with themselves? Anyway. It's a tough know, time. It's a tough time. That's it's worse tough. today than ever because yeah. the Internet's there to kind of right. throw things at you that we never had to deal with when we were kids. Mm-hmm. But so there's a very vulnerable population. And you say to them, and particularly the girls, we're going to, you don't need your breasts. You don't need your uterus and fallopian tubes. Uh, you, don't, you, you, know, you, can, you can do this. Look at, look at my pictures before and after when I had my breasts cut off. I was so happy. I, I got rid of those ugly things that I hated at, at, when I was 13. And when I was 13 and a half or 14, I realized, oh, my God, what have I done? And so you don't come out and say that on the internet because you're going to be a pariah. You will be, mm-hmm. you will be ridiculed and threatened if you say anything that you did was, you know, you wish you hadn't. And we see that with the detransitioners now at Chloe Cole. Yep. And they're just targeted by the LGBT community. And, and you're like, wait a minute, if there's choice, if it's all about fluidity, why are you so mad at the detransitioners who have now realized, wait, I made a mistake? But it's the vitriol is oh, their it's, lives it, are yeah, threatened. I mean, poor Chloe went to a, a, a an organization a meeting in I think it was at Santa Barbara, mm-hmm. and a tran a, a transvesta and I a, a um, drag queen mm-hmm. came up to her and said and shook these giant breasts at her and said, I, "You're jealous because I have my breasts." And th- this was a man, you know. I mean, and she just stood there and took it, you know. As she does, she's oh, you know, she, she, yeah, she's a cool, cute. I mean, she is. Girl. She's she's two people. She's the one that stands up, and then and she's a, she's a just a kid. Mm-hmm. When you get to just sit down with her and just talk about it, she's a teenager. But yeah, like you know, would have had an, an, an otherwise normal life, but who's suffering physically because of all the surgical things that she went through. Yeah. But at any rate, so it's it's a very vulnerable time. They cannot consent, and the the law is there to to say that. But the individualized therapy that they talk about is that we're going to get around the consent situation. We're going to say, this is life-saving. Uh, this is like chemotherapy for a kid with cancer. We're going to save your life. We know you're going to kill yourself. Look how miserable you are right now. And, right. and we're, going to, we're going to make that all better. And they say that to the parents, too. Oh, like, absolutely. your child will kill themselves. They, they coerce them. And hearing that as yeah. a parent. I want to actually get inside what one of these sort of consulting sessions looks like. We have a video um, that I want to show you. This is from... Uh, Dr. Robert Garolfo of the Lurie Children's Hospital. I know of him. In Chicago, yeah. And uh, he's describing in this video when he sits down with a family and the parents aren't really sure what's happening with their child. So I just want to kind of get your reaction to this. So it's usually the young person comes in knowing exactly what they want (laughs) and um, us trying to navigate a process of having that um, done safely and really allaying parents' fears. I mean, sometimes parents will come in and be like, you know, what is my, I, I want to make sure that my young person is, re, that my child's really trans, you know, can you, help, can you help me with that? 
And I'll turn to the child and be like, yeah, so, you know, what gender identity do you have? You know, there's no, there's no form, there's no scale, there's no psychological battery of tests that needs to be done. Really, any, the, the young person can answer that question for themselves. And sometimes that's um, news, I think, you know, to parents, you know, that, you know, think that they're going to come in and have this evaluation that is going to help determine their child's gender identity, when really, it's it, our work sometimes is just getting them to recognize that anyone's gender identity, be it trans or otherwise, is a normal variation, you know, and it's it's not an affectation. It's it's just a normal part of the human condition. So I hear there's no battery of tests. There's no form there. And I'm like, what are we paying you to do, doctor? Like as a doctor, a parent comes into you with a child who's confused or feeling these feelings. What do you say to the parent? And how is that so I, 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 I listened to the parent, okay? And yeah. then each parent separately. I asked, I asked permission to interview each of them separately. The child, if the parents are comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when the parents come to me, they know who I am, okay? They know that I am not in favor of blocking puberty or giving cross-sex hormones as a matter of course, okay? And I, I look at my view, what I'm supposed to do for them is to educate them about the background from which this comes and, and answer questions about the validity of what they're hearing online. And so I just, I, I, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a mental health provider, but you can't be a pediatrician unless you understand mental health and work with you know, depression and anxiety and understand you know, the, what moves and shakes teenagers as they grow through puberty. And, and, and young children as they get, you know, in families with divorce and, and you know, incarcerated parents or drug addicts right. or being physically abused. Because it affects your health and your body. Yeah, I mean, right. it, it, it's, it, the emotions of a child are very important to take care of and to look after. So I, I'll interview them and, and I find out that th there's, there's never a stable family. There's, there's always something and many times many things that have happened to the child to really mess them up in terms of their sense of safety what's real, what they're trying to suppress and not have to think about. And it has, I haven't seen a single kid come to my office who is gender confused, if you will, who has not had this kind of what we call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And so you have to deep go into that. If you gloss over that and just listen to the child who comes and says, I know I'm born in the wrong body, that I think he, he actually freely admits that's as, that's as deep as they go. And the, the, the mental health evaluation is not the kid, as long as they're not psychotic. I mean, if they know, you know that they're not you know, uh, Emperor Jones and, and they don't rule the world and they, they have their own calendar that circulates around them and the sun and the moon and all, as long as they're based in reality and not mentally ill, that's all they want to know. Because then they say, okay, so you know who you are. So now our job is with counseling to get your parents to go along this. With this. And so the parents need to be the ones with therapy the to get them to The parents are given the, 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 the psychological assessments yeah. and, and you know, you're, oh, I think you're just so, so arch conservative and you're so, you're so unfair and, you know, in this day and age, the modern world and blah, blah, blah. And they guilt the parents into it by saying, what, you, what would you like, you know, a, a dead daughter or a, a, tra tra a live trans son? It's your, your choice. Sign here. Mm -hmm. And you look at the consent forms and I've seen them and it's, it's kind of like a real estate contract. Because there's this little places to initial. You know, do you understand this? Do you understand this? Do you understand this? And in there are things like you know you might you know be sterile. You might have uh, blood clots in your in and strokes. You might have heart disease. You might have a cancer. You might have and the kids just go along on their assent form because they have to if they're older than seven, they have to assent, which means they understand. But then their patients do the consent form, which has the same information, and they just sign at the bottom. And the initial, 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 just, you know, like, cause, you know, what is it? You know? Who pays attention yeah, to yeah, that, right. you know, whatever. We've all you done know. that, yeah. yeah. And so, and then they're done. They're ready to go. And that is the depth of it. That is the absolute depth of what goes on. And I call then they're it, on to the conveyor belt the conveyor of belt. the Hormone and therapy. And, and it, I will tell you, to and people who are inside that world absolutely and utterly say, no, no, no. There is a thorough evaluation of the family, the child, the siblings. We, we know that, you know, we, there's nothing that is, is in the background that this is not caused by the environment. This is biologic. They are born in this, this identity, and that's who they really are. And if you try to take them out of that, you are going to kill them. Okay? They'll kill themselves. 
and it's it's a just it's the most egregious lying that you and it just it makes your blood boil when you think that you you don't do that with any other kind of medical therapy. Right. You right. Don't. There's you, no other there's no disorder ethical, that no, you would treat th- that way. No, right. Not at all. So it's a, it's the opinion of a kid, a, an opinion of a three year old, an opinion of a seven year old, an opinion of a thirteen year old angry girl or boy, mm-hmm. and they want what they want. Okay, and they swear they're going to kill themselves because they're told. Oh, by the way. When you go online, the way to get your stuff done is to threaten that you're going to kill yourself. And then that, that's the golden key. They'll let you right through the door. Yeah. And so, you know, I just, I, and they say it doesn't exist, but the psychologist, Dr. Wong from Toronto, said, absolutely, this is how you do it. It's in writing. The man is, is an advisor for transgender kids, and he says, this is what you do. Okay. So I kind of say to my audience when I'm talking about this, so yeah, the, the, the mantra is they must be persistent, consistent, and insistent, okay, about their gender identity. The child. Yeah, the child. And I'm thinking, I would say, okay, how many out of you have raised toddlers? Okay? Yeah. So an 18-month-old child is insistent, persistent, consistent. Does that mean that you let them take that screwdriver and put it in the damn socket in the wall? Mm-hmm. The answer is no, you don't do that. You don't. Because you know better, okay? Does that toddler know any better? No. Okay, you have an adolescent that says, all of my friends drive BMWs. I want a BMW or I'm going to kill myself. How many parents go out and write a check and buy the BMW that afternoon? Probably, maybe a few. But I mean, essentially, (laughs) it doesn't happen. Hopefully not many. You know, because they said they were threatening themselves. You know, they they can't live without it. So why would you do that with something that is, we know, has medical consequences for the rest of your life? that sterilizes you, and that takes away any sexual function you ever, most of which you probably haven't even experienced yet. As mm-hmm. the WPATH files, which you mentioned, internally, the doctors that are doing this say, we, my God, you know, if we block puberty, they're never gonna experience an orgasm. They won't even know what it is. They can't say that they miss it, because they don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. They don't understand the consequences of what they're doing. But, you know, hey, they want it, and uh, let's, okay, I, 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 I think it's probably a problem, but, uh, oh, well, whatever. It's just such a failure of adults in the room to be the adults in the room and to, to take that leadership role that a father should take and a mother should take to protect their children from their own, you know, in this case, very extreme predilections. Um, and what... What really gets me mad is that now that kind of pseudoscience and medicine from doctors like the one you just watched, um, that's being used to drive policy. So now we even have states like California, where even those parents who do want to protect their kids and say no to puberty blockers are being threatened with their kids being taken away from them, right? So this has real life implications um, for many it, people. It's, it's interesting with the laws that are passed, okay? Mm-hmm. so. I've been instrumental in helping state legislators understand the real science and the consequences of these things of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers. And, and they don't have any idea. They've, what they hear is that it saves lives. It saves lives. It's they, this organization, all the major medical organizations in the country uh, essentially approve of this. This is a standard of care. And you know, I could talk for as forever on standards of care and the concept. They don't care about that. It's just that all the big names and Doctor, you're from the American College of Pediatricians, aren't you? I looked you up, and you're a right wing fringe Christian organization, just am ad hominem attacks like that. And I, mm-hmm. I said, no, it's a misunderstanding. I said, just just go to our website and look at the information and look at the science. Okay. It's right there. We have the references. We've developed a website called Biological Integrity as part of our project for that and the same name. And it is, it's for lawyers, it's for teachers, it's for parents, it's for the kids themselves Mm -hmm. and for pediatricians and other people in the medical field to understand the science. Yeah. And we developed it just for that. And it's updated probably once every other week, if not weekly, with all the new information that comes forward. Yeah, funny story about attacks on your integrity. Um, so when they, they were telling me, well, we have Dr. Quentin Van Meter, we think he'd be a really good interview. So of course I went on Google and I Googled your name. And the first thing that came up was a 2020 court case where the judge actually dismissed your testimony as an expert, um, and saying that you weren't citing facts or some, something along those lines. And that was the first thing that I saw when I looked for you. And I have to admit, for a minute, I was like, uh, really? Like, we really want this guy? But then, of course, I dug deeper and realized that that was 
another instance of sort of the great, the long walk through our institutions and being used to discredit people who actually are following science. But could you talk to me a little bit about that experience of your testimony being thrown out of court? Was was that the first well, time? It, was, it has never happened before or since. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I just felt like I was the lowest person on the planet that I'd been discredited in a court of law, okay? Sure. And what it really was was a setup by a very, very clever attorney for the for the patient who was, who's, his, his, the dad wanted, he, dad was transgender himself on and off. Mom, really? mom was a very sort of progressive, wonderful, big-hearted woman who said, I looked into this trans stuff and, and I just don't think the science is there. I really worried, I don't my, want my daughter to have puberty blockers. I don't want it, I'm going to, I'm going to is, you know, ask for full custody, uh, and or at least I get fifty percent of, of the decision making, and I will never, I will never do this. So the dad, I you know, went to court to get full medical uh, permission to granted to him, and the attorney for the mom was just really inept. She was very unprepared. She actually set herself up to be at odds with the judge at the initial hearing. Right? I mean, just really flagrantly did stuff that made the judge very, very angry about about her in particular. She was very unprepared on the day of the hearing, which was postponed, and I had to come back. You know, we cancel a whole other two days of patience and fly and all, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to go into details, but the, the thrust of the matter was that when I went to the court for that hearing date, um, I I had been deposed uh, by the attorney and the uh, the dad's attorney, uh, and it was a grueling. It was almost six hours nonstop, mm -hmm. and just asking the same questions over and, and depositions Gosh, are that way. KGB they just they style. basically want you to be caught under oath testifying, saying words in a row that they can get on on a recording, and then they slice those things out and they they present. D Doctor, can you read page so and so? Did you indeed say this? And it, it's like out of context and stuff. So he opens the the session. The, the the our attorney on our side had not looked at any of the exhibits. She was unprepared. He had an exhibit in there of a spliced video presentation that I did at a conference in Texas, and it's it was made to look like I am a racist and I'm proud of it. I mean, he took. He took, I'm proud of it, being American College of Pediatricians and being on the SPLC hate list because there's wonderful company, the American uh, you know, Alliance for Defending Freedom, FRC, you know, a we, wonderful human being. Yeah, KKK is on there, but, you know, we, we know we're not that brand. And we, it, it's sort of a, you know, hey, if you've got the target on your back from SPLC, you're, you're obviously doing something right. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So At this that's point what, in history, so right? he, it's, it was an African-American woman judge and a, I was a racist and bigot and proud of it. And I looked at that and I said, That's not what happened. What? And the attorney had not said, No, I'm not going to let this be admissible because she didn't even know it existed. The judge just took one look at me and her eyes just, just got really angry. And so that attorney kept asking me really, really, I mean, just saying misstatements. And I would say, Excuse me, sir, but no, this, and, she, and he would object. And she was sustained as a... So I got to say nothing. And she said, she scolded me and said, you need to listen. The attorney gets to talk. You answer his questions. And when he says, you stop, you stop. Whoa. And I said, okay, so let's just focus on the puberty blockers. I've been doing clinical research with puberty blockers for about 15 years. I know the physiology of them. I know the consequences of them. And, and so I started to lay that out. And she said, well... You have to give me some scientific evidence that blocking puberty is harmful. And I said, well, I have a, a study of, uh, of the, a physiologic condition that's like that where puberty is delayed for other reasons, and we already know the outcome of bone density issues with that. What study is that? And I said, you know, at my age, I cannot list the authors and the, the full title, but I did bring the article, and it's in my briefcase, and I didn't bring my briefcase up to the stand because I didn't... I didn't know if that was That's I was allowed to do that. Yes. But if you give me permission, I will go and pull that article. No. If you don't know the authors and you don't know the title, you don't know the article. And then that attorney asked me to be dismissed, and she looked right at me and said, you are dismissed from this courtroom. Oh, and I thought. Justice is served. What? Right? <laughs> and I thought I sort of thought, okay, so I guess I'll just wait and wait, wait it outside in the vestibule. The, the bailiff said, you can't wait in this. You have to go out in the hallway. I'm sorry. You've been kicked out of the courtroom. 
by the judge and you will not wait inside here. So I went out and waited for about a half an hour for the, our attorney to come, and then she never came out. And I just kind of went, Ubered myself to the airport, sadly. And then, then I hear, you know, the order for dismissal was sent to me and it was published all over Twitter, or, you know. Yeah. And I thought, you know, justice was not served. And okay. it, it, it was an inaccurate thing to say that I was dismissed because I didn't know what I was talking about. It was just a very well orchestrated uh, machination by the, 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 you know, the plaintiff's attorney. And it was just like, yeah. wow. And in all of this, uh, all of these threats that we've talked about, it seems that the interest of the child and actually the truth of what will serve that child just gets lost in this drive for an ideology, for an idea, for a crazy theory like John Money with all of his, oh, here's my new theory here. Um, it, and you were saying how it's part of going even back to like the Frankfurt School and the drive of the Marxist kind of drives in the United States to tear down and the tearing down of society. Where does that desire come from? Where do you think people who get sucked into this and become a doctor like the guy in Chicago or like this judge who just, you know, gets so angry about something she can't even look for facts when you're offering to hand them to her. Where does that, um, that anger, that desire to destroy come from? I think it's from dysfunctional people, okay, who who themselves have, have an enormous amount of internal struggles, okay? Um, and I think they imprint, it's very interesting because I have not seen smiles on the face of any of these individuals on that side. They don't smile. There's no joy in their lives. I was I was uh, deposed by an uh, attorney from Lambda Legal and ACLU in in Ohio. They were trying to preserve birth certificate sex and not allow it to be changed, for the purpose of record keeping. I mean, that's something very simple. And these two attorneys just I mean they had sticky notes and they were talking and I mean they they were just grimacing and they were in, just intent. And I, I looked at and I just almost wanted to say, can we stop for a minute? Why are you so unhappy? Yeah, what happened okay. to you? Yeah. I mean, gosh, yeah, do you really? I mean, you're not happy with life in general. And this, your anger just comes through with every one of your actions and how you carry yourself and how you ask questions. You have such an ax to grind with somebody. And it, it, it's your personal ax. Mm -hmm. And I think these axes get, you know, come to the front. And Garofalo, the physician there, has probably tons of those to just, you know, he's he's an individual that's been a lightning rod because he's very fl sort of a flagrant, openly gay man mm -hmm. in in medicine, and he's I think Loves he's to thinking, go public with all you know, his, yeah. I, you know, I am me, and I am obviously very satisfied with everything I believe in, which I don't see that, mm -hmm. I don't see happiness in that man. I think I just think it's it's sort of a, and I and I don't know him. I mean, but I just looking at that little bit of video and watching his facial expressions and kind of how he just sort of denigrates the parents right wow i mean he's not a parent himself i'm assuming and and does not understand what he's he's treating the parents as if they are you know just the, they're in the way yeah, yeah we've got to get you out of the way and that's the whole movement of the of the emancipated minor from the society of adolescent medicine which sort of became an entity in the mid-70s it was to say, you know, kids, you don't have to talk to your parents about anything. You don't have to get permission for birth control, abortions, everything you want, you get over here, and we don't have to talk to your parents about it. Mm -hmm. Now it's to the point where it's we are told that the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, says that children as young as 11 or 12 need to be separated from their parents and interviewed. So you can essentially plant the ideas is yeah, you're unhappy because you're in tried, middle school, yeah. which is a yep. cesspool of social life. Yeah. And but you're there and you're unhappy. And I'm going to give you a reason why I think you're unhappy. Mm -hmm. How about try this one on for size? And I've got my he, she, they, they, them. I said, my pronouns are your, your royal highness. That's yeah. my pronouns. But <laughs> I, I mean, I just don't put them down because yes. I, don't, I just don't even want to acknowledge that that's a concept. Mm -hmm. Wow. Don't bend the knee to that. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So I think a lot of these stories are going to be incredible for some of our listeners because a lot of us live in a nice Catholic bubble. You know, we go to church and we know these things are happening out there somewhere on the periphery. But I don't think we can quite believe that, okay, this sounds too much like Dr. Mengele in Auschwitz or something so horrible. Can you give us a sense of the scope? Like, how many kids are we talking about each year in the United States? Do we have a sense of 
numbers of kids who are going through this conveyor belt at this point? So um, the clinics, um, they claim, you know, to have waiting lists to get in and that they are servicing on an average about 600 active transgender patients, you know, within their organization, per clinic. And this is 60 clinics. And then beyond that is all of the Planned Parenthood stuff that's not monitored. Um, there is no transparency as to what's going on. Now, in any other circumstance, if you, are, you have a protocol and you believe it's really working well, um, you open the doors, you invite people to come in from the outside and say, look what we're doing here. This is, this is our cystic fibrosis clinic. We have you know, a whole team approach. We have mental health providers that come in and they work with the family and the kids. These are the statistics. We have... We have and some, let's just, I'll pick a number. 800 kids come in over the past two years in this clinic, and we tracked every single one of those 800. We can give you those who, that, that d- got discouraged or depressed and left, didn't come back. We've got those that went this far in, and th- this is what happened. 50% of them got better, you know, 30% of them didn't, and there's a question of the rest in between. So all the data is proudly displayed, okay? That is nothing like that ever happens. When you talk to the directors of transgender clinics, they'll say, well, I, oh, I have about 350 patients. And I've blocked puberty with, uh, you know, 600 over so many years. Well, did every child that walked in your door stay with you? How many turned around and went away? What was the process from the moment they hit the day? Who saw them first? What, was, what happened with their psychological evaluation? How deep was it? What did you actually ask? Who did you interview? You know, before you began any medical journey or social journey, what did you do as a baseline? We want to know what you do. Okay. We want to know. If it's so great, you could replicate it. Right. So, you know, this is successful. This is, this is why everybody that walks in the door comes out the other end of the conveyor belt. But we, no, we can't see that. We don't, we don't have any idea if they offer they all claim, that, and particularly the claims come from people who are in the division, endocrine division, who don't do this work. They say, oh, no, 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 no. The evaluations are thorough. I know. They, they, go, they have a protocol. Well, if you have a protocol, can you share it with us? Yeah. And can you share where the patients entered and where, how far they went along before they got involved in this? Mm-hmm. Um, so I look at it you know, historically. I say, okay, I grew up in the 50s and 60s mm-hmm. as a kid. If transgender uh, issues are innate, if your gender identity is innate and it's, you're always suffering, okay, where were the kids that I grew up that had these issues? I don't remember anybody who killed themselves because yeah. they were born in the wrong body. Uh, I don't think I had a friend who committed suicide for any reason growing up, luckily. I mean, it's so traumatic to think of that happening. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't there. Now, if... If you're thinking the numbers are talking about maybe 3% of the population is a conservative guesstimate at this day and age of the number of kids who are gender dysphoric, okay? Like legitimately and, have and, that and it's a guess. It's a, it's a guess, okay? Back before this all began, 6 out of 100,000 adult males identified as transgender and 3 out of 100,000 females. So I it mean, was lower among women. Yes, it was twice, okay. as, twice as much in males as females. Hmm. And that was the adult world, okay? So you figure, okay, that's a reflection of the kid world, okay? You get the adult world, and they did this, and that's, that's the real number. And that, that was stable, 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 until the, and the social media began to show up as, a, as an option for kids to get into things. And all of a sudden, it began to just climb remarkably. Now, right. this, is, this is not necessarily causal. It's maybe an association, okay, mm-hmm. that you could say, well, oh, McDonald's showed up here and the franchises grew and that that it, McDonald's is causing the trend something in the you know, franchise. Right. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so you you want to be careful about what you right. but you can say the trend is that these kids didn't used to be there. Before adolescence was as it has always been. A very difficult time with pimples and teeth that don't match your mouth and your hair awkwardness. You know, yeah. and, and you don't like yourself and you wade through that and your family is there to embrace you and hold you through and say, I did this when I was a kid, it's gonna be okay. Come come cry on my shoulder anytime. I, I was I used to be your age, believe it or not. You know, I once was young, uh, okay? Mm-hmm. And I know what you I know what I went through and you're telling me what you're going through and I just let's how about if we just sit there and hug each other for a little bit. Okay. That I mean so let me tell you normal. I yeah. love you. 
in the middle of your struggles, I am always here for you, okay? And you're going to think of a lot of things. And I want yeah. you to open up and let me know what you're worried about, you know, as a good parent. And so that's the way we got through adolescence, is if we had an intact family, you know, it was, it was this, it, we got through. It was, a, it was like you go into a fog and things happen and you come out the other end and you're, you're functioning, hopefully. Well, and doctors were there to support parents in doing that. Right. Being the you know, for, for any medical issue. Yeah, okay? just the medical issue. So then the, with the whole revolution of, of LGB stuff, okay, that begins to be happening inside this, this fog, okay, and out comes straight individuals and same-sex attracted individuals. Why? You know, oh, it's biologically, you know, it, it born that way. Baby, I was born this way. It was the Lady Gaga, right? And, and the answer is... No, they haven't found a gay gene. They haven't found a transgender gene. These are things that are processes of your environment and your ability to kind of look at yourself and be who you are comfortable being. And you can make judgments about whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. But in the case of transgender, you are taking a perfectly normal body and you're you're basically tearing it apart. Okay, same sex attraction doesn't happen that way. I mean, that's a, that's a that's your social life and your attractions. This is medical damage on this side. You're taking somebody who might be a functional same sex attracted adult, and you're taking away all of their sexuality. I mean, you are basically you're, you're just destroying their bodies. And so that I mean, within the gay community, there's there's an uproar. You don't do this to to our colleagues. You know, you're you're basically saying to lesbians, you don't exist. Right. Okay. Really, it makes them very angry to think that. And so you know that this is this fog that that you go into and you come out the other side. What's happened in in the last you know two generate or two two or three decades is the internet has gone down inside of this place and just rattled cages and given false hopes and. And these kids are grasping, as they always did, and they don't use their family anymore. And then there are family dysfunctions, increased divorces, single parenting, you know, all the things that tear families asunder. And these kids don't have a stable place. Or what they thought was stable abused them. They were sexually abused, physically abused. They were, there's alcoholism, there's drug abuse, there's all sorts of things in that cloud that they have to sort through. And, and before, the extended family might step in and say, oh, you know, yeah, my adult son is an alcoholic. We're going to go ahead. Grandma and aunt so-and-so are going to come, and they're going to have you come live with them for have the an summer. Yeah. And have an intervention. And, and sort of keep you whole as an individual so you're not too badly scarred by what happened to you in this, in this circumstance is well beyond your control. Yeah. So that's what's happened. So the gender confusion or concept of who am I or what am I, where am I going is absolutely natural. It's just that the environment in which you, you experience that is what's changed. Mm -hmm dramatically. And so you have the 5,000% increase in transgender kids in England, you know, from over a decade. Mm -hmm. All right. That doesn't mean you know, if it, biologically, if that were an issue, if you were biologically your gender, then you wouldn't have a 5,000% you know, increase over 10 years. That's not, right. that's not biology. That's, that is the social milieu. Social. And that is such a salient point, And it really angers the people in the transgender industry that they say there is no effect of internet, that they are, there's no grooming online. That is a proven fact that it has nothing to do with that. Well, where do you get their information from? Why do transgender kids, when they're surveys, use social media six times more than their cisgender peers? That's a recent study. So, I mean, yes, the, the world you live in is very much more complicated than it was, but it's basically extracting the family, the intact family, uh, from the life of the child. Let's talk about some signs of hope, maybe. Okay. We'll see if you agree with me. So recently in Europe, we've seen the shutdown of the Tavistock Clinic in the UK. We see um, government starting to pull back from nationalized healthcare funding, gender transition, affirming whatever for children. Um, do you, What do you see as sort of the, the trigger for that turnaround in Europe? And do you see that as a sign of hope for the United States? I would. I, mean, I think it's very hopeful. Okay. The the problem is, you know, the, Europe is ten years ahead of us. So the Dutch protocol started in two thousand, and uh, we jumped on this bandwagon in two thousand and seven or eight. We went full steam, you know, just right off the cliff in the United States, and we left the Dutch protocol behind and started doing things nowhere close would, to it. They even would, the Dutch and, wouldn't yeah, do it. And the Dutch actually <laughs> Great. complained. This right. was not. This is in the United States. They are out of control. These are the people that developed that protocol. The most telling thing was that a year and a half ago, 
there was a really amazing critique of the Dutch protocol study. So they selected the people and the data and didn't report the rest so they could have the outcome that they wanted. That's the bottom line. The whole bedrock of the transgender industry is the Dutch protocol. And what they started out with is they recruited about a thousand kids and they pared them down then to essentially the kids that went through all, and they had 159 kids. Only 79 were left in the database by the time they reported. Out of a thousand? Uh, out of a thousand. I mean, I'm now, a philosophy so what, major, so what, but I know that's not good what, science. What happened? You know, why yeah, did what, they screen out? When did they drop out? Yeah. Why, why did you exclude them? Okay. They were very careful in that protocol because they said, we are not going to pressure the parents. The consent is going to be voluntary. I guess how voluntary you can, depends on what words you use about the parents volunteer something for their child. Mm -hmm. But they would not coerce the parents if they were, you know, if they couldn't, if they weren't online, the kid wasn't brought into the system. So that's where the thousand kind of pared down to, you know, the, the 175 or whatever that were the core group. But they, they basically just, if somebody left, they didn't tell you why. They didn't. They just, just don't mention them in the database. So if you, you have selected population and you report on just those selected things, you immediately bias the outcome to the point where it's not valid. Right. So that's the basis of this. And then what happened was the reality in Europe is that when they went through that and used that protocol, they started looking 10 years out and said, oh, oh when you get 10-year data, you find out that mental health is not good. It's not worse all the time. It, however, they're taking more meds psychotropic meds to keep themselves in, in line with their anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So they're not suicidal so much, but man, are they on a lot more drugs, okay? So these kinds of things start leaking out, and, and in Tavistock, there were whistleblowers who knew this was just tragic what was going on, who never liked what was going on, mm -hmm. who left Tavistock, and then they started collecting the data because they had access to it, and it's everybody. It's not just the ones that they wanted to show came out fine. It's good, bad, and warts and all. And they found out that the emotional problems in the girls with the puberty blockers mm -hmm. were very much more increased. And so they said, shut the clinic down effective immediately till we can really take a, a look at this. And the government said, okay, we're, you know, we're going to realign things. It's not going to be centralized in Tavistock anymore. We need to do an individualized you know, program, and it needs to be based on mental health first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So explain that a little. That's so it, it basically is an, uh, what needs to be done in every case is you're not gonna, you're not trying to change the child's mind. You're just not ignoring how they got to the conclusion. I, I love it. Walt Heyer, who's an adult trend, he's he's written extensively. He's a detransitioner. He's in his early 80s now, and he has a website that called Change Regret, and he gets thousands of hits. You know, people asking him questions, and he said. I'll get on the phone with the individual who's struggling, and I'll just ask them a blunt question. Why do you not want to be the sex you were born? What made you want to change? Mm -hmm. And they kind of look. He said, oh, I never thought of that. You know, it's because my mom always wanted only boys. And the only way I could get her attention was if I became a boy. Something that simple and straightforward that had never been asked before. So, I mean, you know, it's not always going to be so black and white right. and easy to find. Right. But the idea is you go searching. You say, okay, I want to know everything that's happened to this kid since they were born, what their sibling relationships were, if they had friends that died, if they had pets that died, if they got, you know, uh, sexually abused by an uncle and it's his family secret. I want to know everything. And so the kid may not remember, but the parents certainly do. And if it's a parent that has abused their child, they're not, they're not usually going to open up. But it, 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 that needs to be found. Mm -hmm. And you need to know why is this child grasping at straws to be something that they're not, to get the heck out of the situation they're in, into a place where they feel they, they're comfortable. That's what it's about. If you don't ask those questions, if you do all of that and there's no mental health issue whatsoever, you say, well, I... I'm not the doctor you can come to because I'm not going to give you those cross-sex hormones and block your puberty, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, there is a, I don't know why you feel the way you do, but it appears not to be based on any mental health issues. I haven't found anybody that, You've that never is, seen that. I've never seen it. Yeah. So that's the direction England and Europe are going. Yes. 
So do you see the, I mean, the United States is known for being a bunch of cowboys. Are we ever going to get to that point? <laughs> Will we hit rock bottom too at some well, point, do you think? I had a long conversation with Paul McHugh a mm -hmm. number of years ago. He's a, just, he is an absolutely, I mean, he is such a good human person. He's a devout Catholic. And uh, we just chatted about John Money a lot because he, you know, he, I knew him and he knew him as we're from the other end. And uh, he said, you know how this is going to end? He said it with lawsuits. He, Paul McHugh was responsible for bu bursting the bubble of uh, repressed memories mm -hmm. that was swept the country in the 80s where the kids were having their parents thrown in jail for supposed abuses and things like that, that they had repressed these things that had happened to them. And he, he, he basically stood on the side of the parents and said, okay, this is a repeating story. This is, you know, you know it's not true. Let's get some attorneys involved in this. And he helped them devise cases, and, and they won. And all of a sudden, repressed memories just disappeared off the radar screen. And he said to me, I think the same thing's going to happen with transgender. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing lawsuits now. Yeah, you know, Chloe Cole's suing. Okay. Um, you know, a number of the other tra detransitioners are suing. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's, that's, I hate to say that it's, that's what's going to do it. In the meantime, we've got kids that are going to be damaged. I know. Yeah. And I mean, my prayer is that somebody, something really shocks the world into stopping this from happening. You know, Wash U in St. Louis actually shut down their clinic for real mm -hmm. because the legal authority at Washington University said, we are going to be the, the blood of lawsuits and it's going to be outrageously expensive. We are going to fall on this sword. You will no longer do any of this care in our institution. And that was an overnight decision. Well, there we go. Not the noblest motive, but it got the job done, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And then in yeah. Texas, that was supposed to happen because a major donor to, to, to the children's hospital system in Texas found out what was going on and said, I will not, I will no longer have an endowment at, at, the, at the children's hospital. I'm going to withdraw it if you continue. Okay, we'll shut our doors. So it's but, stuff like that. And then money talks. But they were still doing it. And that's the Dr. Heim, who's just come in the news recently, burst that bubble and said they're still doing it. Yeah. Even, even though now it's against the law, they're still doing You're it. Still doing. So there's a facade of compliance, okay? When I talked to the individuals who are all pro-trans here about what's going on in Europe, they said, that's not true. They're still giving hormones. They're still blocking puberty. I said, well, no, actually, you know, the UK actually passed a law that no adolescent uh, can get puberty blockers outside of a rigid scientific protocol which hasn't been developed yet. That's the law of the land. No, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Europe's giving hormones all the time. No, they, and they just stay in that bubble of theirs and plug their ears. No evidence, no, no facts. No. Yeah. And so, but you know, that's, Europe is ahead of us in that regard because they said this was an experiment and this has failed. Yeah. We're not gonna do this. If we ever do it, it will be in the confines of a very strict, ethical, scientifically-based protocol. And that's the only way it's going to happen. And so, but they haven't developed those protocols yet. Yeah. We'll see. Did you watch What is a Woman by Matt Walsh? I've Did only you? seen the trailer. I, you know, yeah, okay. I, 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 won't ask I wanted that. to go behind the paywall. <laughs> I was just curious. I, mean, I really, I mean, he's so, he is so entertaining. And the, and the trailer just tickled me to death because I know the individuals he's interviewed. And, I was you know, going to ask you, know, like, Dr. Marcy Bowers. Oh, my, oh my God, uh, what a piece of work. Him. Yeah. You know, and the things that they accidentally say, yeah. you know, not not even understanding how absolutely powerfully condemning it is to, that they just open their mouth and the words come out. Because mm -hmm. I think they there there must be a sense of, you know, and, you know that imperviousness. That you can't, nothing that, that you're going to see is, is going to hurt me because I'm the expert. And I'm doing what I want, you know, and uh, and you know I, I, the I've hubris, got, yeah, right? I, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and oh, it works all the time. Every one of my patients, Dr. Olson Kennedy awesome. from from Los Angeles, every one of my patients, I've got now people that were not going to graduate from high school. And guess what? They're lawyers, and they're rocket scientists, and they're you know they're theater professionals, and they're they're all successful graduates because they came to me. And I change their lives for the better. And they just glow. And that's the only time I've ever seen a smile, actually. A little twisted there, a little demonic. Yeah. Um, so we get a little, we're joking a little bit here, but I did want to ask, I mean, these are very dark waters and your head is in it all the time in terms of, you know, just the worst of humanity and tearing children's bodies apart. I, it's hard to 
even think about it too much. How do you as a Catholic handle that? Like, where do you find your joy so that you don't just become totally – I don't I don't sense that you're cynical no, about no, anything. No, and, and my faith keeps me from being cynical. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's really where – you know, and I find myself, you know, just talking to the Blessed Mother and saying, just please wrap your arms around those kids and wrap them around me because I – you know, I, I, I ask for her blessings and guidance and care every time before I go and speak anywhere. You know, I say, God, fill me with your words. You know, just, you know, just make me, sh- I, I want to do, I want to do what I know is right and what you've created in humankind for. And, and don't let me accidentally say something that is offensive or looks bombastic. Mm-hmm. You know, the last thing I am is anti-trans. If it, you know, it's labeled that way. But what, we are so pro these kids and saving their lives and getting to the root of the problem and really solving their issues and having them come out as functional adults. So the, I mean, the compassion, I mean, I, it wears me out every time I have one of these. I mean, I can't, I come out of the room and my staff says, are you okay? Mm-hmm. You know, because I, my heart's in it. You know, I, I, I just go out and then one of my most recent patients, I just, she was just absolutely adamant that she was going to get testosterone uh, before the law in Georgia said she couldn't and she was wringing her hands and screaming and writhing and everyone in the office could hear what was going on and I just sat down in front of her and I and I looked at her and I said you know I've seen you five times now and I've I, I deeply care for you she said how can you deeply care for me and I said well it's kind of what I do you know every one of my patients I mean I just look I mean why am I here what's my job and I, I've only met you and you know physically five times. That, and I said, but each time, I I am so sad for what you're going through, and, and I see your ang- obviously your your anguish. And and she said, well, oh. And I said, so, and she said, are you going to give me hormones? And I said, what do you want these hormones? She said, I want to be a boy. And I said, do you know that you can never become a boy you can sort of look like one but you'll never become a boy and she just she said really I mean I can't. well then why would I want hormones and I thought I mean I was just thinking okay the Holy Spirit has just come through here and just woke her right on up and and I said either she's faking it and I'm buying it and she goes to the door and never come back again or she 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 suddenly Something slipped through that crack and her her the switch flipped and she thought this is crazy I can't be a boy and then I don't want to do any of this right. it must be so hard though to then watch her go out the door and every be time like, she, where are they going to yeah, go next yeah, and yeah all you can do is pray right yeah, I do. wow well you do so much more than that uh thank you for all your work and continuing this I'm ever hopeful that this will be more common that people will have a chance to listen to this podcast will you know sort of wake up some people and ask them ask questions you know maybe yeah. not just take it for woke value and something where they if they feel differently they're a bad person amen all right thank you so much okay.